Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot of content to go through today and we're excited that you've joined us. This webinar is going to be a case study on Sonoma County HSD, specifically on how they've built capacity in Apricot from the start of their journey until today. We appreciate your interest in today's topic and your interest in making the most of your Apricot system. My name is Jeff Hagwood. I'm an Apricot software consultant at Sidekick Solutions. We're an independent consulting firm and certified Apricot implementation partner. We help new and existing users make the most of their Apricot platforms. I'm joined today by Vicki Miller. Vicki is an Apricot administrator with Sonoma County Human Services Department, their Family, Youth, and Children's Services Division. Um, which is also known as FYNC. She's based out of Santa Rosa, California. Vicki's worked with Apricot since 2015 as a project lead for FYNC's service provider referral system in Apricot, and we're going to learn a lot more about that shortly. The concept for this webinar started with a, some, a common set of questions. We hear these often from other Apricot users, and Vicki and I laugh because we also find ourselves asking these same questions. How are other organizations using Apricot? What works well for other organizations like us that are using Apricot? And what lessons learned might we apply to our own Apricot systems? With a capable platform like Apricot, it may feel like you don't know what you don't know. And we found that it's helpful to learn how others are using Apricot because whether you're a new user implementing Apricot for the first time or an existing user, finding ways that others use Apricot will help with your own internal brainstorm. So we think you'll find some takeaways in this webinar to make the most of your Apricot system. Now, this webinar is particularly exciting because Vicki and I will be sharing Sonoma County HSD's journey with Apricot from day one until today. We're going to start with a little bit of background so you get a sense of who the county uh, department is and how they use Apricot. And then we're going to cover three phases of HSD's journey with their Apricot platform, specifically initial implementation, their transition to go live and their adoption of a continuous improvement approach. We're gonna cover a lot of ground in this presentation today, but I do want everyone to rest assured that you're gonna get a copy of the slides from today, as well as a recording of this presentation. Those will be sent to you via email at the conclusion of the webinar. We're also gonna open up for questions at the end of the webinar, and we'll stay on the webinar as long as there are questions to be answered um, so that we can have that dialogue with you. All right, so let's dive into some content. So to start off, I'm gonna hand it to Vicki and she's gonna give us some background on the county and HSD. Good morning, thank you, Jeff. The Sonoma County Human Services Department, uh, we strive to support the health, safety, and well-being of individuals, families, and the community. We provide a diverse set of supports and services, and we collaborate with community-based agencies and service providers. Because we have a wide reach across the county, collecting data for analysis has always been one of our top priorities, as well as the concept of shared measurement. In 2011, the Sonoma County Human Services Department studied the viability of a countywide shared measurement initiative. At a high level, shared measurement was defined as the ability for cross-sector partners in the community to collect, manage, review, and report on client progress and outcomes. We wanted to better understand what programs and services were adding up to improvement in the lives of families, youth, and children. The shared measurement vision was to develop countywide outcomes that would drive evidence-based practices and support community domains like education, income, and health. 
Multiple stakeholder groups were engaged in the process to determine what, if any, part of shared measurement could be implemented in Sonoma County, specifically whether implementing a data system for shared measurement would be possible at all. One conclusion summarized the primary challenges. There are strong views among important stakeholders that a shared data system to track program outcomes will never be feasible. Objections include cost, the inability to link data across multiple systems, privacy issues, community-based organization, CBO resistance, and the data entry burden on CBOs. In total, a data system for shared measurement was deemed too ambitious, too costly, and too burdensome on the proposed stakeholders and partners. The vision of a data system for shared measurement was put on pause. So the idea of shared measurement resurfaced in 2014. Upstream investments, a part of the planning, research, evaluation, and engagement division known as PRE, they took a second look at the implementation and management of a data system for shared measurement. Building on the conclusions of the 2011 study, Upstream decided to pilot a small set of programs to test the overall concept of shared measurement. Upstream's hypothesis was that they could get shared measurement off the ground with a smaller scope, which in turn would have a smaller overall budget. If we could show program results, regardless of whether those results were positive or negative, the county might be able to build momentum around shared measurement. Upstream's goal was to get the ball rolling. In contrast to the larger vision addressed in 2011, Upstream Investments defined a pilot program that included deeper provider collaboration, lower overall budgets and staff time, technology integration, and a model of shared outcome measures. The missing piece was a software platform to support the initiative. Here's where Apricot comes in. So it was selected for the pilot and implementation began in 2014. Before we explore our Apricot journey, beginning with that initial implementation, let's add a bit of context to our Apricot. Apricot addresses our goals for shared measurement by being easy for end users to get started with the platform, customizable to various program workflows and requirements, capable in its reporting features and tools, which are all built in, and it's scalable for more users, programs, and capabilities. So our current um, system right now has 237 active users. We have four assigned administrators and we have over 120 tier one and tier two forms in our system. User groups are across two HSD divisions and those are subdivided into 18 separate programs. It is a large system and it didn't start out that way. <clears throat> We've incrementally scaled our Apricot to support the workflow and outcomes of each program. We use Apricot for programs that focus on advocacy, case management, information and referral, service coordination, collaboration and communication, constituent relationship management, application processing, and survey collection, just to name a few. So let's explore each program to give you a sense of the overall variety of programs we operate in Apricot. So with FYNC, we provide case management and child welfare services to children and families. When a family needs additional services to support achieving positive outcomes, FYNC refers the family to community-based service providers that contract with the county to provide various supplemental services. We use Apricot to track and report on referrals made to contracted service providers. So service providers have, um, they all have Apricot logins and they collaborate on referrals with FYNC staff in Apricot. Apricot is also a portal for sending and receiving information about a family 
the services they are receiving, and the achievement or non-achievement of family goals in each service provider's program. Prior to APRICOT, we used paper-based processes and fax machines to send referrals to service providers with no way to check in on a referral's active status without calling the service provider directly. With APRICOT, we can now monitor referral status and report on performance in real time. So FYNC is only one of multiple programs that we operate in APRICOT. Upstream Investments is another program and is a team within PRE uh, that maintains a public directory of evidence-based programs in the county. They call that the portfolio. Upstream advocates for evidence-based practices. They provide training, technical assistance, they do relationship building, and they primarily use APRICOT as a constituent relationship management system. Now, commonly we think of APRICOT as a case management system and Upstream uses it a little bit differently. They process applications, they track outreach activities, they log events in attendance. They also use APRICOT to populate their searchable website directory, which saves them time and gives their constituents access to the portfolio data on the web. Another program that we operate in APRICOT is the Road to Early Achievement and Development of Youth, for short, called READY. READY collaborates with 11 school districts in Sonoma County to assess social, emotional, academic skills of students entering kindergarten. They collect survey data from parents and educators via APRICOT. Those are done with web forms. And those two surveys are correlated via some duplicate matching in APRICOT to produce a full student profile. That profile is then used to summarize countywide data, and then they share that data with schools and the community. Keeping Kids in School is another program, also a collaborative effort between a number of different departments and organizations. You might begin to notice a theme of collaboration among all of these stakeholder groups. Internal and external users working together in a shared data system is a key feature of HSD's APRICOT. We're gonna get into more on how that works and how we've been able to achieve that more a little bit later. On the KKIS side, they provide family-centered case management services in the home, school, and community. And APRICOT facilitates an, a complete suite of case management features for managers and service, um, service providers to track their services, conduct needs assessments, build service plans and goals, track attendance, behavior, grades, and then they also take exit survey. Fairly comprehensive case management system. The city of Santa Rosa also uses APRICOT as part of the HSD system for the VPP program. VPP supports youth um, that are at risk and VPP uses APRICOT to track referrals into the program, participant status at intake and exit, services while received in the program, and then assessment scores pre and post. The neat thing about VPP is that they're able to aggregate data from multiple providers who all have logins and then conduct a program evaluation for aggregate reporting. A new addition to APRICOT is the HEART program. We just started this in June. HEART provides housing locator information and referral services to individuals and families that are victims of domestic violence. APRICOT provides the referral intake and case management system for HART. They track services, victimization types, and also use APRICOT for client demographics and grant reporting. So as you can see, the HSD APRICOT system is home to a variety of programs. They've got different workflows, focus areas, and outcomes in different domains and with different operating procedures. 
The neat thing about Apricot is that its flexibility and technical capabilities have allowed us to adopt these different operating procedures. We've certainly scaled up over time and from day one have constantly honed and tuned and worked on each of these programs to make them the best that they can possibly be. So designing those systems began with initial implementation. This is a common process that all organizations go through with Apricot to set up and initially configure the database. But initial implementation presented a problem, a challenge that we needed to address. We had to quickly implement a single data system across two divisions and dozens of programs. User groups were both internal and external. Part of the problem is that we didn't want to go into a long-term or ongoing implementation. We needed a concrete end to each program's implementation. We needed users in the system quickly so we could start collecting and analyzing data within those pilot programs. The whole goal was to get the ball rolling. The shared measurement pilot couldn't waste any time and Apricot implementation couldn't hold up the process. So when we look back at initial implementation, there was three major takeaways from that phase, which in any implementation project may help an organization who's getting started with Apricot. The first is that we decided upon a staggered implementation timeline. The, the fact was that the scope of a single implementation project was just, it's, it was too big. There were too many prog programs to handle at once. The primary issue is that we couldn't bundle the whole project together because we couldn't devote full attention to all of the program implementations at the same time. HSD staff were busy with their existing roles as it was, and we needed a tighter timeline that could sustain stakeholder focus. With external parties involved in the process, we couldn't expect that they would stay engaged for a long period of time. So what we did is we split the implementation into two groups. Although we didn't want to wait too long to get started, we, just, we decided that the second group would start 12 months after the first. That's what ultimately provided us the breathing room to commit to each group on its own. In the end, we were able to complete the first group in just under eight months, which included 13 programs under FY and C's banner and two programs under the pre-banner as part of the Upstream Investments Initiative. Group two began five months after that and continued for about four months. And we were able to boot up three separate programs for KKIS, BPP, and Upstream, the CRM. Ready and Heart were later on down the road um, in 2016 and 2019. So although in total it took us a 15-month window to implement the two groups, internal and external stakeholders were only required to invest maybe three to four months of focused attention on any one implementation. Staggered implementation in the end gave us the right dose. It also helped us maintain realistic goals amid the excitement at the start of the project. With everybody raring to go, we needed to set some realistic expectations. So in addition to a focused timeline, we also needed a consistent implementation methodology for each program. We found that in order to involve internal stakeholders across many different programs, a consistent implementation methodology would give us a rhythm during implementation. So what we did is we decided that the first phase of any implementation was going to focus on form design and data entry configuration. We intentionally left report development, data quality tools, and workflow tools until after each program had launched. 
this is what gave us that focus on implementation. So it was a four-step process. We started with discovery and blueprint. That was the exploration of each program's use case. We took a look at program models and outcomes reporting. We even took a look at feature requirements. Those were all translated into the Apricot platform and formalized in requirements documentation. That gave us the roadmap. So with those in place, we then configured data entry workflows in Apricot. While discovery and blueprint had a high time commitment on HSD's end, they were able to step back during the build and take a short break before a next phase would require heavy investment from them. And that was testing and review. During testing, HSD stakeholders demoed the use cases, they provided feedback, and we made change orders in real time to refine the system into a go live format. Now, as we talked about at the beginning, the big challenge was user count. We had lots of users. And because there were so many people participating in Apricot, we knew we needed formal documentation on how the system worked. So what we did is we drafted custom user guides for each program, and we found that users really leaned into those user guides during training. So in total, a consistent implementation process addressed Apricot's configuration. We were also able to get user documentation to those 200 users, but the technical aspects of Apricot didn't address a big gap in our process, which was the expectations and responsibilities for each user group that would be in Apricot. The collaborative so aspects of HSD needed attention, and so we moved into a people-based process with stakeholder agreements. Right, and so we, um, with stakeholder agreements, we felt like we needed to formalize those relationships. So in addition to the technical aspects of implementation, we felt it was important to memorialize our relationships with all the stakeholder groups. We knew a shared data system was new territory, so we drafted formal documentation to set expectations, define responsibilities, and to get early buy-in. The drafts used during initial implementation were straightforward. Some were formal contracts and others were just memorandums of understandings. Regardless of the format, the goal was the same to um, establish clear definitions of the mutual interest in shared measurement and apricot use. Both PRE and FYNC were able to implement apricot with collaboration from external non-staff stakeholder groups, and that collaboration still exists today. That in and of itself is a feat and that we're proud of. Uh, while the format of these documents have evolved over time and our various divisions and programs format them a bit differently, we believe these types of formal documents are essential. Whether you are collaborating on Apricot with an external provider or partner, or you are securing buy-in from two or more internal programs that share the same Apricot license, it's a good thing to have these formalized agreements in place. So some of the key elements for these documents that we include are a description of program and data system use, identification of data formatting and quality expectations, definitions around security and confidentiality provisions or procedures, especially if data sharing is involved, a list of role-based responsibilities, including explicit tasks for the players involved, an outline of financial commitments or budgets that support the relationships between the parties, and a summary of performance expectations or standards for the program. The next chapter in our journey with Apricot is closely linked to the initial implementation. Although we were able to quickly configure Apricot for data entry, there was one another hurdle that we had to overcome and that was how to transition from implementation development to steady state within each program. 
This was a daunting challenge. Although we had started this process before initial implementation, including the legwork of relationship building on the people side and configuration on the technical side, getting 200 users to actually use a new system and to generate momentum towards steady state was still on our radar and needed some attention. So looking back, the results of this transition were mixed. While a majority of our programs got going right away, we experienced some obstacles with others. The transition identified a few gaps in our original plans for shared measurement, and it also presented a few new opportunities. Upon reflection, these outcomes are common and to be expected. While most of what is planned works out, a change of course may be needed to avoid pitfalls and adjust for new opportunities discovered. For us, what this meant was that two programs were abandoned as part of the shared measurement initiative and other programs were slower to get started. So why some hits and misses? Here's our conclusions, although they are subjective. Uh, but the majority of the difficulty we experienced in this transition was due to changing program assumptions at or near go live. In most cases, this happened when new assumptions about the program were brought forward, the program was evolving during implementation, or in a few cases, the program needed to go in a different direction. Because Apricot's a custom system, changes to assumptions may require modifications, which may delay user adoption in the transition to steady state. So a couple other factors that included the delays, um, a delay in data migration, which slower, that slowed user onboarding because there was no historical data in the system and too little end user involvement during implementation discovery, which caused some users to be reluctant to use Apricot even after training occurred. So on the whole, our major takeaway is that modifications are part of the game and to be expected. Continuous improvement based on changing assumptions is something we explore in more depth later in the webinar. Go Live showed us how important it is to remain invested in capacity building for Apricot when the underlying assumptions of your system evolve. So we think it might be helpful to show you an example of how some things changed from our initial implementation assumptions to that Go Live and transition in the steady state. So let's take a look at an example. Within the first six months after Go Live, the FYNC referral programs in particular required some major modifications to account for a new assumption in the program. So in the beginning, we assumed that all referral workflows under FYNC would follow a template, 13 programs all following a common process. We hope to standardize that referral process to gain efficiency in Apricot by doing so. The reality was that each referral process included subtle differences from that template. Those nuances by program really hindered our ability to onboard new users. Some users just didn't take to the template model. We had to adjust the template for each program independently, and we did that by engaging service providers in a redesign process. Secondly, we assumed that service providers would provide updates on referrals every 30 days. And by doing that, they would submit a record in Apricot. But as we onboarded new users, it quickly became clear that both FYNC and service providers would benefit more if they were involved in status setting, or we called it status setting for referrals which represented a more real-time collaboration instead of an interval. The big limitation is that we were boxed in. Our design just would not allow us to set up the permission structure so that service providers could edit referrals submitted from FYNC. We had to look for another way. 
We wanted them to see the referral, but not edit it, and at the same time needed them to update status in real time. So this is an ERD or an entity relationship diagram of our change before and after. And it illustrates the change in the data structure that was prompted within months after go live for these 13 different FYNC programs. We got away from the template by customizing the referral form and the referral status form to account for the custom processes with each provider. The second part is because we needed a way for service providers to collaborate on a record, so edit a record, we needed a new form, and that was the referral status form. So in the beginning, we had just a referral form, and then users would submit 30-day feedback forms via a separate record. The referral form was locked down. No permission set access to edit it, so that's where we got boxed in. To correct for this, we added the referral status form, but that had two implications. Number one, it added an additional form and additional links to the referral. Number two, in order for users to complete a referral feedback, they would first need to navigate to a referral status and use a wizard link. Whereas the prior version required that they complete a referral feedback via the document folder. So we had not only structural changes, but also process changes. Now, this process actually helped us in the long run. The referral status record became the home base for service providers, and it was the genesis of real-time caseload reports and data quality dashboards. The total is that we were stuck without the change, but we gained new capabilities by changing the program assumptions and modeling Apricot after those new, new assumptions. So reflection on the need for redesign immediately following implementation offers a handful of takeaways and they're, they're worth noting. The first is that although program leads may lead the charge during implementation discovery, and there's some excitement to do so, it's important to include some end users in that process as well. The major takeaway and lesson here is that those closest to service delivery can expose assumptions that may imp impact Apricot's design. Second, the configuration in GoLive may not go as you intend. As Vicky mentioned, modifications are part of the game. As users begin to use that system day to day, they're going to inherently find gaps and new options for the design. What I always say as a rule of thumb is that you should expect feedback that will prompt updates heavily within the first 90 days at minimum. The third point is that if your program assumptions change and the system needs modifications as a result, explore the opportunity for those modifications. The evaluation that you conduct on those options might vary. Your opinion on the value of making a modification may, may be different depending on the cost, but generally speaking, the cost of maintaining an improperly designed system especially one that users are skeptical about, could cost more long-term. Now the exciting part, phase three. So the current part of our journey is where we really feel like we've hit our stride. But just like any other phase, this one also comes with its own challenges and goals. The first is, how do we build capacity without negatively affecting what's already in place? We have good user sentiment. We don't want to break that in the hopes of progress. The second part is, how do we prioritize a steady stream of user feedback into developments that make a difference? 
HSD wants to grow the vision of what a shared data system can be, but also wants to sustain a positive user experience. So in order to grow effectively in Apricot, we've needed to develop some systems that, for lack of a better term, keep us in the lane. So as we progress past implementation and deeper into steady state, we decided that our efforts needed to pass the capacity building test. Is the change we intend to make a net increase in capability or feature set? Does it even enhance the system? We have to start asking this question. If the answer is no, then we queue the project for later, or we may even abandon it. If the answer is yes, then we move forward, but we prioritize it in our queue of active projects. Early on in the process, we noticed that it was very easy to fall into uh, rearranging the deck chairs, so to speak. Tinkering and perfecting the system along the same path is, is easy, and that's especially true of form design in Apricot. You can make multiple small form changes or form configurations, but those may not level up your overall Apricot experience. We tried to prioritize and, and do now new projects that are a net positive in capability or functionality, and we steer clear of that net neutral zone. Because building capacity in Apricot is about stacking new and valuable systems on top of another, one piece at a time. Now, to get our Apricot right, quote unquote. And because there are so many programs in the HSD system, we treat the experience of each user group as its own app. Now this may sound counterintuitive because Apricot in itself is the app, but within Apricot we subdivide it into 18 separate apps. We build a separate set of tools, a separate set of processes, and we help people make the most of that app in their own group. When we think about apps, we think about four main domain areas. And by sticking to these domains, we can focus on Apricot's potential. We've got them listed up here on the slide. The four are data entry and workflow, data quality, performance reporting, and user resources. So let's go through a few examples. For data entry and workflow, we focus on form link configuration, field selection, form logic and linking fields, the workflow tool, and dynamic dashboards. Dynamic dashboards relate to reports that are placed on the My Apricot home screen. Each program app has one or multiple dashboards, and we want to hit this point because we think it's important. The report that you're seeing here is located on the My Apricot home screen and is an example of a dashboard we use for the HEART program. It shows pending referrals that require an intake on the top and then active cases on the bottom. When pending referrals complete intake, they fall off the list and then they move into active. The active then summarizes the active caseload, which prompts navigation for the housing locator. So the conditional nature of this type of report, it's almost like a to-do report, streamlines navigation and reduces the number of clicks. It also can replace some of what users do in tier one search, which we find is a positive. For data quality, we try to put as much on users as we can. We place these data quality topics in dashboards so users can take action much the same way we do with workflow. All of our data quality tools that we build in HSD system are conditional, meaning they look for errors and then they clear from that report when they're resolved. So here's an example of a data quality checklist report for lifelong connections. You can see 
that there are seven different data quality domains. When this report is blank, meaning there are no rows, data is clean. If it's not blank, that means there's things to correct, and those corrections fall off the list when they're done. So performance reporting is a large topic. Um, we think about capacity building with reports in two categories. First, each program app will have a deck of standard reports. Pretty common, those are things like quarterly or annual reports. But then we build ad hoc explorations to learn more about the data. Now it's important to note, reporting is a pretty dense topic, and there's multiple reporting platforms that you can use with Apricot. We use all of them, and we're not ashamed to say that sometimes we take that data out into Excel for additional processing. So when you think about reporting, you need to match your tool with your use case. When it comes to performance reporting, uh, this contract outcome summary report for FYNC is one of the more exciting developments we've had in the past 12 months. This is an example of a report that models contract outcomes by service provider. So service providers have contracts to meet certain goals, and this report is what we call a quarterly process report that highlights whether or not those goals are met or not met. Now we've removed the key data from this report, but you can quickly log into this report and see in real time where a service provider is at. We're currently deploying this across 13 programs, and this is a report that I, I know that Vicki gets very excited about. <laughs> that I do. <laughs> so lastly, we focus on user resources. Now, this is not the most flashy topic when it comes to capacity building, but it includes things like data entry guides, workflow descriptions, and workflow diagrams. All of these tools, every single one of them, is placed on the My Apricot home screen so users can access them from one place in Apricot. And for the most part, all of them are hosted in Google Drive. So new versions are automatically available to end users when they click any one of these links. This is just a look at a stack of resources that we have for the CAPS program. It's a 30-page user guide in Google Docs. It's a three-page downloadable workflow description that we host in Google Drive as a Word document. And it's a one-page printable workflow diagram with definitions that's in PDF. Again, all linked from the My Apricot home screen. So to wrap up the concept of capacity building on the technical side of Apricot, there's four main domains that we think about and we try to honor each one. Now, the big question is, with those four domains, how do we generate new ideas and topics for improvement? And I'll let Vicki talk a little bit about that. So to generate new ideas and topics um, for all of our programs, we complete an annual system assessment. We request, request feedback from users and complete administrator reviews of core functionality. We gather feedback from users by asking such questions um, about their overall experience, such as what is the most pressing challenge you have right now? What is working for you? You can see these questions on the screen. What is nice to have and what are some of the need to haves? What would you change? And another important one that we laugh about is what are you tracking in Excel? So our goal around that is to determine what people are tracking in Excel and how can we build that into the system if we can. So for all the FYNC programs, I complete uh, site visits once per year, and this has now become a systematic procedure. We didn't start off doing these site visits, and this has evolved over time in the last couple years. Uh, we focus on the user feedback. Uh, this has been a valuable component of our continuous improvement process. In addition, we have an open door policy for all our service providers. Uh, they can contact me to give suggestions or let me know if they need something changed or added to their form or report. And on a as, on a, as needed basis, we provide one-on-one -on -one meetings outside of the yearly site visits. 
Annual system assessments have prompted re-implementation of every program in HSD's APRICOT system except for two. Those, um, the two exceptions have undergone various updates to keep them relevant as the program evolves. In addition to the 2.0 re-implementation, what we call, um, we also make regular ongoing improvements to APRICOT. Gathering feedback from users has been very helpful in this effort, but incorporating frequent user feedback was initially a challenge. So one of the things that we experienced, the challenge was, is gathering feedback is one thing, but prioritizing it and deciding what to implement and what to queue for later is something that um, I've learned over time. Uh, both Jeff and I started by doing everything service providers requested. Um, this wasn't, uh, we had the I can do it attitude. Um, this wasn't always efficient or productive and did cause some anxiety to get users everything they wanted and to maintain the integrity of the system. So while the intention of that was good, uh, we had to rethink that a little bit. So what we've learned over time is to evaluate user feedback more thoughtfully. Sometimes we may need to say no to the request or maybe or we'll think about it. Uh, we'll put it in the queue and not all user feedback is implementation ready and may not support the integrity of the system. So after, uh, administrators need to be selective in the revisions they take on because A, there is limited time to work on apricot and B, even simple changes that seem simple at the moment that they're being requested often end up requiring more work than initially perceived. And that's a key, the more work than initially perceived. And that's where we developed a new process this year called the system change checklist. And this is how we both evaluate new concepts to implement as well as assess whether or not the concepts we are implementing are fully formed. Given the sophistication of, of the county system, we found that any single change impacts many subsystems. For example, forms impact reports, reports impact permissions, and the list goes on and on. Once we decide to pursue a project and before we make any change, we go through this checklist to make sure that it's comprehensive. So let's just go through this real quick and, and, and walk through it on a simple change. So let's say that we want to change a field value in the closure reason drop down on a referral or, or an enrollment record. So maybe something like closed with services, closed no services, and maybe we want to change closed with services to, to closed with services or some or complete services. We want to change the field value. Pretty simple process, it seems like. We should just be able to go into a form, change the drop down, publish the form, and away we go. But if we step through this checklist, we find a little bit of a different story. So, number one, is this a form change? Yes, it is. So, we develop a spec for the change, which would be a blueprint. Is data migration required? Well, technically, yes because we're changing a field value from one thing to another. So we develop a data migration specification for the change. Then we update the form, we complete the data migration. Is this gonna impact any reports? Absolutely. So we review which reports include the closure reason field for possible filter or formatting mismatches. And the checklist continues. If report updates are required, we copy those existing reports, develop them separately, and test changes before we publish them live to users. Then we update our workflow diagrams and descriptions, plus user guides if that's needed. In this particular case, there's no changes to permissions because it's a field change, but this would apply if it was a new report or maybe we added a new form. And then we inform users and admins of the change the definite and the definitions that are captured in the user guide. So as you can see, a subtle change, even changing one field value on a dropdown, can impact a number of subsystems, which all need to be accounted for. And that's what the system change checklist does. So 
So with the ongoing process of continuous improvement uh, that we are committed to, I can't overemphasize the importance of leadership buy-in for Apricot. Sonoma County leadership has allowed autonomy for Apricot admins to facilitate the processes described in this webinar. They don't participate in the day-to-day -day operation of the system, and they are involved in significant decision-making when prompted by Apricot admins. So however, the type of autonomy required to make this relationship work requires investment. Leadership buy-in with a hands-off approach requires the allowance of administrator investments and time, trusting that admins will prioritize apricot task appropriately and keep momentum building for the platform. This also means that leadership is willing to make new investments in apricot, like new apricot features that come along, more user seats as needed to, um, to build the programs and consulting support. Leadership must also be realistic in what Apricot is to the organization and its value in decision-making. We at Sonoma County are seeing the investment in Apricot pay off. It's taken us about four years, but we're now seeing that. And as we transition to database decision-making, we are able to spot performance gaps before they become larger issues. Our Apricot system is highlighting areas where we might save on cost and deploy more effective resources in our community. So our vision for shared measurement is in motion. The patience and perseverance to stick with the vision through growing pains has been a key to our success. That could not be done without leadership setting clear expectations and providing Apricot administrators the flexibility to do what they do best, which is to manage the system. So we want to wrap this up with an observation, and it's a little counterintuitive, so bear, bear with us on this. The HSD Apricot system is getting simpler. We've done 2.0 implementations with all of our programs, and we're starting to see um, a refinement happen. It seems completely counterintuitive, especially given the focus on capacity building. You think that the Apricot system would get more sophisticated or more complex or dense. But as we increase that sophistication and capability of our reporting systems, the database architecture and back end of Apricot is actually getting simpler. And it's become more apparent, again, in our 2.0 re-implementations. Vicki and I call this getting closer to the source. And that's where the source is the underlying assumptions of the program that use Apricot. Much of what we thought was important in the beginning has been pruned back. Unused features, we've abandoned some systems, we found some better approaches to use cases, all of that's led to a more leaner and vibrant Apricot platform. Now, no doubt that hindsight is 2020, but much of what we thought was important at initial implementation just hasn't been as important long term, which is why we find continuous improvement in Apricot so important. So to put this into practice and make this tangible, we've adopted an implementation principle for new features called baseline design plus user pull. So that means that we develop a baseline system first. And during initial use of that system, we allow users to pull new use cases, features, and updates into the design. So that ensures that the system requires less modifications long term, but it's also leaner up front. We prioritize a foundational system, and then we just build new features when users or the urgency for those new features dictates. It's not really a new concept. Uh, we've taken this, this piece from other lean implementa implementation methodologies and software development. But at this point, nowadays, we're much more inclined to trim back rather than add by asking a very simple question, is this necessary? So when Vicki and I meet to review priorities for HSD's Apricot, we often step back to reflect on the many steps it's taken to get where this system is today. The bottom line is that building capacity is a one step at a time process. It's a journey. 
over time, that capacity building refines and grows your apricot. It's nothing short of just a steady march towards your vision for the system. And again, as we reflect on this, that's our version of capacity building in a nutshell. It's the thing that's really guiding our growth in apricot. And at this point, it's taking us into the next phase of the journey. So that wraps up today's webinar and we really are thrilled that you could join us today. Shortly, we're gonna open up for questions, uh, but before we do that, we just wanna hit a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, a recording of today's webinar is gonna be provided to you along with the slides. So please be on the lookout for that. Also, if you enjoyed today's presentation or any of our approaches to Apricot, we'd love to connect with you. Our doors are open. Uh, we'd love to learn more about your organization, your Apricot. Feel free to send us an email. So let's go ahead and open things up for questions. So Vicki, I'm gonna take a look at our questions panel here. And if anyone has any questions about um, HSD or Apricot or anything related to, day, to today's webinar, please feel free to type those into the questions panel and we'll answer them one by one. Sounds good, Jeff. And I just wanna say thank you too for participating in this webinar and happy to answer any questions about our process. Um, you can enter those or email me. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we'll stay on as uh, long as there are questions. We're happy to give the time to clarify any details. So Jeff, do we have any questions coming we, in? We do, and I'm actually reading through them to, to parse through them here. Oh, good. So this is a question, uh, is the annual review for programs in the HSD system held at the same time for all programs? for things like review of trends or change in impact across other programs or features, or is it staggered? So Vicki, do you wanna answer that question on the FYNC side? And then I can answer it on some of the other programs. Sure. I, I stagger it, but it's within a couple month period of time each year. Um, so I do the site visits. I try to do them within like a two or three month window. Um, just to kind of consolidate that. So that's how I um, address the site visits and getting that annual review from each of our service providers. Globally across FYNC, also the pre-programs, annual assessments are generally done at or around the fiscal year break for the county. Mm -hmm. The fiscal year break is not only a fin financial break, but it's also a scheduling and strategic break and it's a good opportunity to touch base and see what we wanna do in the new year. So generally they're all done around the same time. I will tell you that we are getting more fluid and, in, and engaging more across programs to share what features are working best. Um, I know Vicki, uh, we were talking earlier this week had a, a leadership meeting on Apricot where various divisions and departments and heads relating to the app, the programs in Apricot get a chance to share. Um, that is actually an ongoing process that help that I think, um, and Vicki, you can speak to this if you like, I think supports the shared nature um, of Apricot. Because as this question highlights, um, do you review trends or changes in impact from one program to the other? Um, Sometimes that can be challenging, but that sharing is becoming more prominent um, in these regular check-ins. I would agree with that and nothing more to add on that. I will add one other thing. Um, while I do, um, I do complete a site visit once a year with all of our service providers, the other thing that I do on a quarterly basis is in pulling the quarterly reports internally for the, each of the programs. If there's anything that's showing up in those quarterly reports that um, I have questions about or just need some attention, 
um, that's where um, I might schedule a one-on-one -on -one visit with that particular service service provider outside of the um, the scheduled site visit, the annual site visit. Perfect. So, Vicki, I'm just looking through our questions here. So here's a question that comes up. Um, how often should we expect to change our apricot configuration uh, based mm -hmm. on those changing program assumptions? Mm -hmm. That is a tough one to answer. Um, <laughs> Nick, do you want to give you want to give a crack at? Uh, oh, Jeff, um, I was thinking you would do that. <laughs> well, I can get started. It okay. It depends. And I know that's a terrible answer to the question, but in general, so the 2.0 implementations that we've done at HSD have, have been about two to three years in between initial implementation and the 2.0. Um, the, sta the staggering of initial implementation is what that two to three year um, frame looks like. Now that said, the way that we approach Apricot is really from uh, an ongoing perspective. We queue priority projects um, and then attack them in sequence. So from a redesign perspective, we're technically doing that all the time. Major redesigns are happening in about a two to three year window where we're really exploring the global nature of how that program operates in Apricot. Thank you, does that help? You think that answers it? I do, I do. And what I would say is what we, what I might add is that the, the programs that we started four years ago and built out, we've learned things along the way. And so it's time to go back to that adoption of simpler is better. Um, not to compromise the integrity of the system, to real, but really to build on the integrity of the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here's another question. Um, for the collaborative aspects of Apricot, uh, based on the way the programs are designed, is there a different license for collaborative engagement in Apricot? That's a great question. Um, HSD uses a standard Apricot license. Uh, the number of users and the way that the system's configured is what facilitates the collaboration between external parties and internal users. So there's not anything that technically that makes HSD's Apricot different from any other Apricot system um, other than the way that it's structured and the way that it supports the workflow for their programs. What do you think, Vicki? Would you add anything to that? Would you read the question again, Jeff? Yeah, is there is there anything different um, about your license that allows for collaborative engagement? Um, so is is it a different if is a different license to have these external users? Or that's how I read this question. Right. And I would I would say there's nothing to add to that unless we wanted to talk a little bit about the shared um, shared agreements with our external partners. Right. Yeah. So, Vicky, do you want to touch on the on the shared agreements that you have with external partners and what? I mean, we talked a little bit about what's included, but is there anything else that you'd add that you think is important about how those get put together? Well, for us at FYNC, it's just part of the contract. Uh, so we contract with our service providers and in the scope of work um, and what they sign the, in the contract agreement, they sign off that they're, you know, that they're going to use Apricot as a database to receive referrals and to enter data. Um, and so that's just written into the scope of work. And that's just become a standard procedure for all of our contracts now. So Vicki, here's an add on to your que the question about site visits. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a good one. We've, a we've actually talked about this and, and thought this might come up. Um, how much time do you spend putting those together? Mm. 
So the site visits um, for each of our service providers, so the site visits are about uh, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, between an hour and two hours. And then I spend probably about an hour to two to um, just to prep for those. I look through the quarterly reports. And then um, the follow-up, I would have to say, really varies program by program. So I did a site visit with one of our service providers on Monday. And I had quite a bit of takeaways from there, some reports that I needed to develop for them um, or to consider developing. I don't know that I will. Um, I'm going to take that back and discern um, the need for those. And then some form changes. And so if I end up doing like the form changes, then that involves a data migration. And so all of that might end up being, oh, I don't know, maybe a week's worth of work. Um, so it really varies um, on how how much time. It depends upon how much how many things get uncovered at that site visit that need to be attended to. Perfect. That's great. Well, Vicki, I think that wraps up all the questions. Any other questions that people have, again, you can send us an email. We'd be happy to answer them. And you can also reply to the email that you'll receive with the slides. Um, and a recording of today's webinar. Thanks again for everyone joining um, and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.